we're really happy to have we're really happy to have uh, Marissa Gee with us today. She works with uh, Alex Watermanski at Cornell. She's a six-year graduate student, and she's going to tell us about optimally navigating a piecewise deterministic world. So, Marissa, thank you so much for being here, and please take it away. Cool. Thanks so much for the introduction. Yeah, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about optimal control uh, with a focus on optimal path planning for models that are mostly deterministic but might have some stochastic jumps uh, in them. And most of this is uh, work that's been done with my advisor, Alex Vladimirsky, and then also one of the projects was done with a team of REU students. So they're also listed here. So I'm gonna start by providing some background on a pretty classic deterministic control problem and control framework, and then extend that to the piecewise deterministic setting. And then once I've covered the background, I'm gonna talk about two applications that I've looked at what sorts of insights this modeling framework can bring to these real world applications, uh, and then also some of the numerical challenges that can come up solving these problems. So jumping right in. So when we're talking about optimal control, we're going to be talking about some sort of system that can be characterized by a vector of state variables. And at least for now, I'm going to assume that we care about the behavior of this system on some known time interval from zero to some capital T. And that's really where we care about its behavior. And we can influence the system via some control variables, which I will call A. And that leads to a set of controlled dynamics. The evolution of our system is gonna be some function of our current state, eventually the time, and also our control variables. So to make this a little bit more concrete, one example that you can think of is a fish population. Maybe you're keeping track of the size of the population and you have some influence over it because you can harvest uh, and you can specify a harvesting effort H. And if that population would normally be modeled by something like logistic growth, then your controlled dynamics might be a logistic growth equation with this extra harvesting term corresponding to how much effort you put into exploiting that population. Another example, one that I'm gonna focus on is path planning, where your state is gonna be your position and I'm just gonna work in 2D space. And then you have some model for how your position evolves over time. I'm gonna focus on a very simple model of motion where you have a speed that is specified by your state and potentially your time as well, but it doesn't depend on what direction you choose to move in. So we call this isotropic. And your direction of motion is going to be your control variable itself. So we're assuming that at each point, you essentially get to choose a unit vector that specifies what direction you move in and your speed is specified by the environment. Now, everything I'm gonna talk about today could in theory be generalized to more complicated models of motion, but that may introduce uh, computational challenges just in terms of having enough storage space and computation time to solve the problem. So if we have some op, uh, influence over our system, right? how do we control it in an optimal way? Well, we need some notion of an objective. And here, since I said that we care about the behavior up until some time, capital T, our objective is also gonna be measured up until time, capital T. And we're gonna assume that you have some sort of running cost that you accumulate over time and a terminal cost that you pay at the end. This could also be reward and maximization, You know, all of that applies but I'm gonna focus on the minimization case as our general framework. And so we could define a total cost starting at a state X and a time little t and following some uh, values of our control variable. And then our total cost is gonna be the integral of our running cost up until time capital T plus whatever terminal cost we pay based on our terminal state. So our goal then is to find a policy that's going to minimize that cost, where a policy is now a function that maps from our state variables plus time into our set of control variables. Returning to our running example, if I'm trying to exploit a population of fish and I have some function that tells me the profit I can get for selling each fish, and I also have some function that tells me either the future value of having some fish left over, so I'm not harvesting this population into extinction, then I could maximize some profit that's going to be the value I get from selling the fish that I harvest 
plus the value of having a population that I could exploit in the future. Now, another version of this, if we're path planning, maybe we're controlling some sort of vehicle and we want to minimize fuel expenditure. If we have some measure of how we're expending fuel to navigate the environment, and maybe some other measure of how much extra fuel we would have to spend at the end to get where we want to go, we could write a total fuel consumption as this integral expression, and maybe we want to minimize that. Now, I'll just say for now, uh, if you've seen path planning problems before and are like, well, there's a better way to model a problem where we're trying to reach a desired target, that's very true, and I'll talk about that later, but for now I'm just going to focus on the case where you care about the behavior up until time, capital T. So once we have this goal of finding our optimal policy, how are we going to do it? Well, I'm going to focus on a dynamic programming approach, and a very important concept in dynamic programming is the value function, which is a function that can be thought of as encoding the optimal cost to go from every possible state configuration. Mathematically, we can write it as taking the infimum of our cost function j over all of the allowable policies that we could choose from. And one reason why we really like to have a value function is that it actually encodes the optimal policy. So if we know the value function, we can basically for free also know what the optimal policy is. We can also show that for the situation I've outlined, the value function is going to be governed by a partial differential equation. So this is a classical time-dependent HJB equation. And a couple of things to note about this. First of all, it's time-dependent in this case, and it has a terminal condition because at the end of our planning horizon, our optimal cost to go is just going to be whatever terminal cost we have to pay at our last state. And also it's nonlinear because of this minimization that we have. And in general, when we have this time dependent problem with a terminal condition, a nice way to go about solving it numerically is to just solve backwards in time, right? Using your favorite discretization scheme and working backwards from your known terminal condition. So let's make this now a little bit more interesting by adding randomness. Now, if you wanted to add randomness to your system, you could just take the evolution of your state and say, I'm going to make it some sort of diffusion process. And methods exist for dealing with that. But that's not the case that I'm going to look at. Instead, I'm going to say, what if we have a new state? So we have x, our previous state variables. We still care about those. But we're also going to add an additional component to our state variable, which I'll call the mode or the operating mode, which is this little m. And m is a discrete variable. You can also think of it as indexing what the current mode is. And we care about this mode because it's actually going to affect the dynamics and possibly the objective of our system. So here I've written out the evolution of my state can now depend on what mode I'm in. And same with the running cost and the terminal cost. And the randomness in this problem is going to come from how the mode evolves in time. So specifically, we're going to assume that those transitions between switching from one mode to another happen according to some sort of stochastic process. Specifically, you can think of the current mode of the system as being the state of a continuous time Markov chain. So this is just one possible example where you have three modes. You can be in any one of them at a given time. And the transitions are going to happen according to some known rates lambda. And since this is a Markov chain, right, the time until the next mode switch is going to be exponentially distributed according to whatever your transition rates are. And in this scenario, you can see that if I'm a planner and I'm currently in mode two, the only transition available to me is to go to mode three. So at some point, I'll probably switch to mode three, but the time at which that switch happens is random. Now, if I'm in mode three, the time of the next switch is still going to be random, but now I could switch to mode one or I could switch to mode two. So there's going to be randomness in the switching time and randomness in what my next mode is. 
So you can have both options uh, when you're dealing with these types of problems. Another thing that I want to note is that for the problems that I'm looking at, we don't have direct control over the mode switches. So we don't have a discrete component of our control that says, I want to switch to mode two right now. But we do assume that the transition rates can be state dependent, which means if I'm the planner, I cannot say, I want to switch to mode two right now, but I can potentially say, I want to control the system so that it goes to a state where switching to mode two is likely. So that's the kind of influence that we have over what mode we're in. So let's go back to our examples and make this a little bit more concrete. So I'm not exactly a, an expert fisher, but something that I've heard I think is generally acknowledged is that it can be easier to catch fish when it's raining. So we could return to our fish harvesting problem, but say now the mode is going to represent the current weather. So maybe it's sunny, maybe it's rainy. And we're going to have some sort of efficacy that affects how much fish we can get depending on the weather. Okay. So we have random transitions between sunny and rainy weather. And we have this variable E that depends on the mode. So now the dynamics of our population are going to be affected by what mode we're currently in, because it affects how much we can harvest. And our objective is also affected by the mode. Because again, how much profit I can make is going to be affected by how effective I was when I was catching those fish. So another way we could formulate this is returning to that path planning problem. If my terminal cost was a measure of some remaining fuel that I needed to spend to get to some nebulous target, well, it's possible that there's more than one target. And I don't know exactly which one I'm going to have to reach. And so if a mode represents a possible future target, then we could have a problem where our dynamics don't depend on the mode at all, but it is still showing up in our objective in a terminal cost. And here, the transitions between modes are pretty arbitrary. I'm just illustrating that you know they don't have to be symmetric. It could be that you only transition from mode one to mode two and never transition back. So we would like to then solve this optimization problem, right? If I can write out this cost or this reward J, even though it now has this mode dependence, and I should also note that it means that J is now a random variable because the evolution of M is random, I still might want to try and minimize, for example, its expectation. And to solve that problem, the idea is we're going to take those mode dependent J's and we're going to use them to define mode dependent value functions. So now I'm going to have a value function u for each possible mode m. And it's still going to be the infimum of my cost function, but now I'm taking an expectation, since that is a random variable. You could look at other versions of the problem where you're minimizing a probability or doing some sort of robust control, but I'm just going to focus on the case of the expected value here. And this is essentially now telling us what's the expected optimal cost to go from state x at time t and currently in mode m. And just like before, if I can recover these value functions, I can figure out what my optimal policy is going to be. And so it's possible to show that these value functions are now going to solve a coupled system of PDEs. And so with this system, we have a component that looks basically exactly like the time-dependent HAB equation that I showed earlier. So this is essentially governing the dynamics if a mode switch does not occur for a short amount of time. But now we have this extra term that describes the coupling between the modes. And this is basically saying, if I'm currently in mode M, then look at all the possible modes I could switch to. Well, what's the likelihood that I switch? That's going to be our lambda, right? And then if I do switch to some other mode n, take away what I thought I was going to pay, which was u sub m, and replace it with what I'm actually going to pay in my new mode, which is u sub n. And that leads to this coupling term in our system of equations. And finally, uh, we still have our terminal conditions. They might be mode dependent, 
But this does mean that we can actually still solve this problem backwards in time. So we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel to solve this problem. I'll also note that while it's definitely going to increase our computation time, right? If we had to compute one value function before, maybe now we have to compute three value functions. That increased computational cost is much less than if we had, say, increased the dimension of our state space, which would increase the size of the value function exponentially and be a lot harder to compute. So having extra copies of the value function, it is more expensive, but it's better than like adding another state variable. So with that background out of the way, I want to illustrate different ways that we can use this and the benefits that we can get using it as a modeling framework and also kind of the interesting numerical challenges that come up. I have a question. So the first, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, could you go back to yeah. the previous slide? Yeah, so then you have PD. So what is the, the space domain for, for this PD? Like, uh, is it bounded domain or something like that? Do you mean what space does the value function do, like the solution? Yeah, the, the, the value function, the, the... the value functions. You said the value function here use spam is to solve this PD, right? So then what is the main for, for the X, uh, the spatial variable? Yeah, so, the, so your state, right. So for your state space, you're generally going to assume that you have, I'm generally going to assume at least that I have some sort of bounded domain, especially for the path planning problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, if, let's see, for path planning, your state space might just be a like closed subset of R2. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the fish population, you could assume that you have some maximum population and your fish, you know, live from in, the population of your fish lives in like zero to some maximum population. Okay. But okay. generally, the state space is going to, I'm at least going to think of it as some subset of RD, and generally like a bounded subset. I see. Okay. Thank you. For most of what you've written so far, though, it doesn't particularly matter, I think, right? Like, you yeah. think of it as a, sub a bounded subset because you're doing a path planning problem, but of course, it works just as well in all of RD. If you pick any two points and draw a rectangle that's big enough to contain both those points and yep. solve in that domain or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for the theory, it shouldn't matter too much. For the numerical methods, right, you'll need to specify where you're solving the problem numerically. But again, like you can just pick the region to be large enough that you're not going to leave it over the time horizon that you care about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so let's dive into to a first application of this. And so this is going to be looking at a modeling application in ecology, where we have foraging animals and they're trying to navigate some sort of dangerous landscape. So first of all, just a little bit of background uh, on optimal foraging theory, which is a very well established branch of kind of biology and ecology literature. And it seeks to predict what an animal is going to do as it tries to collect food. So how is it going to allocate its time? And the main idea between op behind optimal foraging theory is to treat that animal as some sort of rational optimizer, with the thinking being that if evolution has acted in a way to maximize fitness, then maybe animals have also evolved to be optimizers of some quantity that's related to their fitness. Now, since you can frame this as an optimal control problem, it's pretty natural to start to apply a dynamic programming approach. And a lot of models have done this in the past, although they tend to focus on simple and discrete environments where, for example, what I have here is an animal that can choose between three different food patches. And these patches may have different returns on investment for the time that the animal spends there. They may have different danger levels if you're modeling the impact of predators. But these discrete models can't capture kind of the rich detail and data that is available about some real world landscapes the animals are trying to navigate. So what we would like to do is we would like to take this optimal control framework and see if we can bring it into a continuous domain while still accounting for these considerations of the animal needs to collect food, the animal needs to avoid predators, how are we gonna model those things? 
So that brings us to the landscape of fear, which is a term coined to refer to the spatial distribution of what prey animals think the danger level is in their environment. So how likely they think they are to be seen or eaten by a predator. And studies exist that try to estimate this quantity for complicated real world landscapes and also showing that it tends to have a large impact on the behavior of prey animals. So if we would like to make use of this data, we need to specify some sort of continuous optimal foraging model. And that's exactly what we're gonna try and do. So since we are, since this is a navigation problem, we're definitely gonna keep track of our position in space. And since we care about the animal collecting food, we're also gonna keep track of its current energy level. And we assume that if the energy ever reaches zero, that means that the animal has died of starvation. And then we're keeping track of time. We care about the behavior up until capital T. And we're gonna assume that this animal is trying to maximize some expected final utility, where this utility should maybe roughly correspond to that animal's future reproductive success, if this really is justified by evolution. Where the randomness and thus the mode switches are gonna come in is in how our foraging animal interacts with a predator. So we're gonna assume that our foraging animal can be in one of three modes. The first one is when its main priority is collecting food and it hasn't recently been spotted by a predator. So that's foraging. The second mode is when it has recently been spotted by a predator and is trying to escape from that predator. So we're assuming at least that a predator doesn't instantly kill an animal. There's a little bit of time and has a chance to escape. And then mode three, it's kind of a dummy mode because that's when the animal has already died. There's no planning that needs to happen. We don't need a value function for mode three, but it's useful for illustrating transitions. So what are the transitions that can occur? Well, we assume we have some rate at which the predator can spot our prey animal, which will switch it to mode two, some rate at which the predator kills our prey animal, switching it to mode three, and some rate at which our animal can evade the predator or equivalently, the predator can give up on the chase, switching back to mode one. And I haven't included the argument here, but you should think of all of these as potentially spatially dependent, so changing in the environment. We also have a deterministic transition, right? If we ever reach E equals zero, then we die of starvation and switch to that mode three. So for completion, I wanna show the dynamics of this problem, but I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it. I'm using those same isotropic dynamics that I showed earlier, but now we can have a mode dependent speed because maybe you're running faster, right? When you're trying to escape from a predator than when you're just collecting food. And we have energy dynamics that roughly say you have some feeding rate in mode one, capital F, that's gonna increase your energy, but you only get to collect that food in mode one. And you have some metabolic cost, capital K, that's going to decrease your energy. And these second two terms are just making sure that we never exceed some maximum energy and that if we ever reach an energy level of zero, we stay there forever because we've died. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the utility functions that we use for this problem. Because the kind of optimization framework of these foraging animals is such an essential part of optimal foraging theory, there have been a lot of studies and a lot of debate about whether it's reasonable, one, to treat animals as optimizers, and if it is, what quantity they're actually optimizing. And so one thing that's useful about our model is that we don't have to specify a utility function in advance, and potentially someone could hand me their favorite utility function, I can say, okay, we'll try and solve the problem for that one. But for this presentation, at least, I'm going to focus on three potential candidates. One is a linear utility function, which roughly corresponds to an animal that is risk neutral in its planning. One is a concave utility function, which is going to be more risk averse. And one is a sigmoid curve, which is kind of a combination of the two, where if your expected utility is below the inflection point, of the sigmoid curve, then you're actually going to be more risk seeking because you have a convex utility function. But if it's beyond that inflection point, 
then you're going to be more risk averse. So we can explore how these different utility functions affect the predicted behavior and if it would even be possible to tell the difference between an animal that was optimizing one and an animal that was optimizing another. Can I ask, just, just trying to uh, get some intuition about this. Um, so this risk averse, say, like what is this telling me? It's telling me that if the energy level is high, then the animal like doesn't feel the need to go forage more. It's more averse to risk, whereas if it's low, then it, then there's the spike, so it feels the need to go forage very very quickly. Is that that can kind of be how the behavior manifests? I think a useful way to think about it is in terms of like the variance in the rewards. So like a risk averse planner will prefer uh, like a reward distribution with a smaller variance, even if the mean is slightly lower. Um, whereas like a risk seeking uh, planner would actually like prefer a higher variance, like means being equal. Um, and so that can manifest in the behavior in different ways in terms of like exactly when the planner is willing to take a risk or how much risk they're willing to tolerate. But that's, I think, kind of the underlying intuition for it. I'm going back one slide. I, I think I just missed where the U comes in, or maybe two slides then. You you haven't missed it. So oh, it doesn't okay. show okay. up gotcha. in the dynamics. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So so our, our utility function is actually it's about to show up here because it's our terminal condition for the problem. So since we're just assuming that the animal is trying to maximize that terminal utility, uh, it shows up as our terminal condition. And then this is that system of PDEs written out for this specific case. I'll just highlight that this is kind of the part with no mode switches. Here, you might notice that I no longer have the minimization, and instead I have this norm of the gradient. That's just a simplification that comes from the fact that I'm using this isotropic dynamics. Um, it isn't too important, though, for the problem that we're looking at. It would affect the numerical method slightly uh, for other versions of the problem, but it isn't too important. And then we have these coupling terms that correspond to the mode switches between the different operating modes. So, all right, this falls directly into the framework I showed at the beginning. We can solve this backwards in time. The numerics aren't actually that interesting. So instead, let's look at some results. So for the first example I want to show, we're going to take our continuous model and kind of treat it like it was one of those discrete optimal foraging models. On the left here, I'm showing the food availability that the animal is working with. And there's essentially two patches of food that the animal can choose between, a better one on top and a worse one on the bottom. And then we're also going to have a variable rate that the animal is spotted by a predator. So what you can see is that from this white square, which is where the animal has to start and end its planning, that's a condition that we've imposed. In order to reach the food, it's going to have to cross some amount of risky area where it might be spotted by a predator. And we'll vary this, but in general, the top is gonna to have more food, but it's also gonna have more risk. So we looked at this example and said, as we vary the risk level, in the top half of the domain. And as we vary the initial energy that the animal gets to start with, what sorts of choices is our planner going to make? And we can summarize them by just indicating which food patch the animal is going to choose to visit. So here I'm showing it for two utility functions, the risk neutral and the risk averse. On the horizontal axis, we have how much more risky the top half of the domain is. And on the vertical axis, we have what initial energy level that animal is starting with. And the first thing that you can see is that actually for a large range of these parameters, the behavior between the two utility functions is going to be the same. They're both going to choose to take the extra risk to get to the better food path, right? This yellow arrow means they go up. And so for a large portion of this parameter space, we couldn't tell the difference by just looking at what patch the animal visited. 
But there are some differences. So at high energy levels, both planners will be more likely to either visit the bottom patch or in the case of the risk averse planner, maybe stay home entirely and not risk being spotted by a predator at all. And in general, as the risk increases, the risk averse planner is much more likely to avoid that extra risky area, go to the bottom patch instead. But while this might be insightful, we aren't just working with a patch model. Right? We have this continuous model, and so we can actually get extra information about what's going on here beyond just which food area does the animal choose to visit. So here, I'm looking at a fixed level of extra risk in the top half of the domain and asking what is the path that the animal should take to and from whatever food patch it decides to visit. So here, orange is the outbound trip and black is the inbound trip at the end. And we can see how the path changes for many different initial energy levels. Specifically, as the initial energy increases, there's less incentive to spend a lot of time collecting food because you have more food energy to start out with. And so the planner is more willing to take extra time to take a longer path that avoids the riskiest parts of the domain. Another interesting thing to note is that in this case, the animal is much more likely to take a large detour on the outbound trip than on the inbound trip at the end of our planning horizon. That could somewhat be an artifact of the finite horizon that we use, but essentially it illustrates the fact that any extra time that the animal spends traveling home is going to affect its terminal utility because it doesn't have any time to try and collect energy to make up for that detour that it took. And now for this risk neutral planner, it eventually switches to the less, risk, less risky patch when its initial energy is high enough. So we can look at the same thing, but for a risk averse planner, and these are roughly equivalent energy levels, although slightly different to highlight different parts of the behavior. And it has a similar pattern of behavior, but the detours that the risk averse planner takes tend to be longer. And specifically, it takes longer detours on that inbound trip on the way home. And then it also switches to the bottom patch at an earlier level. But this shows that even when the two planners are visiting the same food patch, there can be differences in the path that they're taking to and from that area. All right, so another example that we can look at is trying to take a little bit more advantage of the fact that we have this nice continuous model and seeing if we can take some detailed real world data and look at how animals may react in response to their environment. So this is data for Samango monkeys, which are a breed of monkey that live in South Africa. And here I'm showing the food availability on the left and the probability of being spotted by a predator on the right. And we can ask, given this environment, what sorts of paths might we expect an optimal planner to take? So here I'm showing for a bunch of randomly chosen starting locations, what trajectories should these ant should the monkeys take if they actually were maximizing some terminal utility. And the main thing that we can see is that they do tend to avoid the highest areas of risk of being spotted by a predator. And they tend to congregate in this bottom right corner, which if we go back, we can see there's a lot of food there as well. Notice that they tend to actually pass up this food rich area because the chance of being spotted by a predator there is relatively high. And so at least for the parameters that we've used, the trade-off isn't really worth it right there. And instead they're gonna to go to this better area. So we can also look at the behavior specifically when the animal is trying to escape from a predator and summarize that here. And we can look at behavior on the individual trajectory level. So here I'm showing for a single starting location and for three possible spotting locations where the animal spotted by a predator, what is that behavior going to look like? 
for the risk neutral planner, we can see these detours in black that correspond to where it is spotted by a predator and tries to reach a safer area until the predator goes away before continuing on its way. We can do the same thing for the risk averse planner in blue and also for the sigmoid planner. And there we see a pretty dramatic change in behavior where the sigmoid planner is actually much less concerned with collecting a lot of food and instead prioritizes, get, prioritizes getting to a safe area where it can wait out essentially the rest of the planning horizon. So these aren't meant to necessarily say once and for all, this is what a monkey should do in this scenario, but rather to illustrate that we could take this data and provide a range of possible scenarios based on what a hypothetical monkey might be optimizing. And then if we had trajectory data for what these monkeys actually do, we could compare and see which one seems the most realistic. So to summarize, using this optimal foraging framework, as well as techniques from continuous optimal control and path planning, we were able to create a model of continuous optimal foraging that, that can take advantage of some of the kind of detailed data that's available for these problems. We can give information about where foraging animals should spend their time, but also what paths they should take to and from optimal foraging locations. And we can look at the behavior both in the immediate presence of a predator and not in the immediate presence of a predator. And all of that can be used to help distinguish between different utility functions that these animals might be optimizing. So after this, I'm gonna move on to uh, a different application. So this might be another good time to pause for questions if there are any. Yeah, yeah, I was just about to ask. Um, if you go back to the pictures of the domain, um, and uh, yeah, back a little further where you see the whole domain. Um, you wanted to skip over the numerics a little, <laughs> but I'm gonna ask mm -hmm. about the numerics. So mm -hmm. when you uh, when you discretize this, are you solving in the rectangle and just setting velocity to zero in like the holes? Or are you actually triangulating this like, bizarre shape and solving in that on that triangulation? Yeah, numerically we are solving it on the rectangle, which is definitely not the most efficient way, right? Because you are keeping track of you know a bunch of essentially useless information. Um, but but that is the strategy that we're using. It's the easiest way. It's the way I would have chosen, but I would have been impressed yeah. if you like triangulated <laughs> this very bizarre. No, no, no yeah. Cool. Um, so is, this is an actual like region in South Africa then? Mm -hmm. Is it like, yeah, a, so... like an apple preserve or something? Like, why does it have this very bizarre shape? I guess is all I'm trying to get at. So we, yeah, so this is an actual region. It was studied in depth and right, the data is available. That's why we use this example. Uh, we tried to figure out exactly why it has the shape that it does. Um, and as far as we can tell, it's because the scientists who are observing these monkeys, they were observing kind of multiple groups and keeping track of where they roamed over a certain period of time. And this corresponds to kind of where those monkeys were seen. Uh, we did wonder if there was something like a lake or a mountain or something like that. It does seem like there's maybe a more mountainous area right around here uh -huh. okay. that may have less canopy. And so you don't expect to see monkeys in that region. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the smaller regions, we don't know exactly why they're cut out, but there just isn't data available okay. for those points. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other questions? All right, if not, I'll move on to a second example. So we're still gonna be talking about path planning, no longer talking about monkeys, and instead, we can think of this as more of a like vehicle path planning problem. So for this, I also want to introduce a slightly different way of looking at our path planning framework. So far, I've said, let's assume that we know ahead of time that we're planning up until some time capital T, and then our problem stops, we pay a terminal cost, and we're good. As I alluded to earlier, this may not be the best framework for cases where we have a navigation problem, where instead of navigating up until some time, we want to navigate until we reach some target set. And once we get to that destination, the problem is over, but we may not know a priori at what time we'll reach that destination. So that's the framework I'm gonna look at here. 
we can still specify a speed, a running cost, and a terminal cost. Although if you've noticed, I've removed the time dependence for each of them, because if those quantities are not time dependent, turns out that our actual cost is also not going to be time dependent. It's just going to depend on our location relative to the target set. And so we end up with no time dependence in our problem. So you can show that the value function in this case is going to solve essentially the iconal equation, which is this PDE. And instead of a terminal condition, we now have a boundary condition that's specified at our target set. And for this version of the problem, even though we can no longer work backwards in time, efficient methods still exist for solving this problem. So you can either, you can use fast iterative methods that have been developed, but you can also use what are known as causal methods, which try to take the idea of working backwards in time and apply it to a problem with no time dependence. In this case, that generally involves working outwards from your target set. And you can show that if you update your uh, points in your discretized grid in the right order, that you can solve for your value function in one suite. So these methods are nice when you can use them because you don't need to rely on iterations. So we can also the same game that I played earlier and introduce mode switching to this problem. Here I'm going to jump right to the PDEs. And we essentially have this iconal equation that was showing up earlier. And we have our mode switching term that couples the system. And we have boundary conditions for each mode. And one thing to note is that in general, once we allow these mode switches to occur, it's gonna be a lot harder to use a causal method because the kind of guarantees that we had about nice orderings of the points, well, the mode switches essentially make that more difficult. So sometimes we'll still be able to do it, but sometimes we'll have to rely on iterative methods. So the concrete example that I wanna talk about for this is a vehicle that's trying to navigate some domain, reach a target set, but it may become damaged along the way. And so our mode is going to represent how functional the current the vehicle currently is. And at least for now, we're going to assume that a functional vehicle can become damaged, but a damaged vehicle can't become repaired in any way. So there's no switching back once you switch to mode two. And this damage mode tends to be worse, either slower speed, higher cost, something like that. So in this case, you can write out the governing equations for that specific system. And it turns out that your mode two value function, well, that's just governed by basically a normal iconal equation. It doesn't depend on mode one at all. So you can solve that equation. And then once U2 is known, it turns out that there are methods that also exist for solving this top PBE efficiently. So in this case, we can actually still use a causal method even though we have mode switching. And for an example of that, let's look at a Mars rover that seeks to navigate some terrain, but may become damaged along the way. And when it is damaged, that's going to lead to lower speeds, especially on steep slopes, and so may affect the trajectory that the rover can take. So I'm going to skip through this a little bit quickly, but here we can show example trajectories when the rover is broken down, right, corresponding to these red X's and dotted lines, versus when the rover is fully functional and is more able to navigate steep terrain. And we can even see how these trajectories might be connected. Where here in black, you're seeing one potential trajectory for a fully functional vehicle, as well as potential breakdown locations and the subsequent optimal trajectory in mode two. All right, what if we want to make the problem a little bit more interesting, though, and say that once the vehicle becomes damaged, that's not the end of the world. Maybe instead of continuing to its original target, it should go to some sort of repair depot where it can get repaired and go back to being functional. Well, if we do that, then notice I haven't actually added a random transition back to mode one. And so 
these PDEs that I have for my two value functions stay the same. What I have done is change the boundary condition in mode two. And I've also changed the boundary set. I said, now we're trying to reach some set D that has these repair depots. And once I get there, if I pay some repair cost capital R, then I get to switch back to mode one, and then I just have to pay U1 from that location. So this is a more interesting problem because we can no longer solve things in one sweep. We can no longer causally kind of order these modes because now mode two depends on mode one and mode one depends on mode two. So we're gonna need to use an iterative method. What we decided to do was say, well, hey, if we had some way of initializing U1, for example, then this is a known boundary condition, then we can efficiently solve for mode two. That's great. Similarly, if we had some guess or some initialization for U2, well, we could treat it like a known quantity, and then we have an efficient method for solving for U1. So let's just do that. Let's initialize, let's come up with initial guess for one of the two quantities, and then iteratively update them by solving each of their equations, treating the other as if it were known. And this is nice because each iteration is very cheap because we're using these efficient methods, but it still has the problem that it can take many iterations to converge. So to try to address the number of iterations problem, we accelerated it using uh, something known as policy evaluation. So here policy evaluation means taking some specified policy, no longer treating this like an optimal control problem, and just evaluating the cost of applying that policy, whether it's optimal or not. Specifically, if I have some guess for what the value functions are, well, each of those value functions corresponds to a potential policy that I could use. So I can say, let's extract the policy from those value functions and then evaluate the true cost of those policies. And that turns out to be equivalent to solving a linear system of PDEs, which I've written out here, where R1 is essentially taking the place of U1. And note, this shouldn't actually be a zero. Uh, this should be whatever your terminal cost is. Uh, and R2 has essentially taken the place of U2. And so this is a linear system. We can solve it using your favorite linear solver, uh, but it may be large, so it may be a little bit slow. So what we do is that after we've applied a bunch of these cheap value iterations, if the change between iterates starts to stagnate, we'll do one policy evaluation and then start those value iterations again. And this, for us at least, turned out to greatly speed up the convergence of the algorithm uh, in a way that was useful. So looking at an example where you actually have repair depots, in this case, you're trying to reach the gold star, that's your target, and these red buildings represent repair depots along the way. And in mode two, right, we're assuming here that your speed, your cost, all those things are constant. And so you're basically gonna travel in a straight line to a repair depot, favoring the one that's closest to the target. We can also look at mode one. And what we can see is that if there's a chance of breaking down, you won't actually take a straight line to the target. You may, uh, that line may be deformed slightly so that you're closer to the trajectories as you travel towards the target. So here I'm gonna show optimal trajectories for different values of the breakdown rate. So these don't all correspond to the value function that I'm showing. If there were no breakdown rate, you could travel in a straight line straight to the target. If you have a moderate breakdown rate, you might start to get closer to those repair depots. And it turns out that if you keep increasing the breakdown rate even further, it becomes optimal to essentially travel in a straight line to the best depot, and then from that to the next depot, and then from there to the goal, because it's almost guaranteed that you'll have to go to a depot anyway. So some of the benefits of using this framework, right, for this modeling problem is that we're able to take a path planning problem and encode additional information about our vehicle or rover or what have you 
without actually increasing the state space. So we instead use the mode to encode this additional information. And it's not as expensive as if we had added some continuous state variable that represented how functional the robot was. And we can use that to develop optimal navigation strategies and also characterize the cost of undesirable outcomes like having a breakdown occur and having to subsequently get some sort of repair. All right, so to sum things up, hopefully I have now convinced you that these piecewise deterministic models are a useful and interesting problem worth studying. They can give us useful insights about the real world uh, and also that they're actually a very natural extension of kind of classical uh, deterministic control problems and the solution techniques that have already been developed for those problems. So even when some challenges can arise, there's a lot of theory and methods that we can fall back on to efficiently solve these problems. So just some ongoing work that uh, I'm working on and interested in. A big question that I didn't address at all today is what to do when you don't have perfect information about what the mode is for the system. So you might imagine that maybe you had initial information, but then you don't get updates about when mode switches happen. Or maybe you get noisy information about what mode you've switched to. You can ask some interesting questions about, well, can you still plan in those scenarios? Can you still come up with an optimal policy? And some work has been done for the noisy observation case. And I'm working on some problems now related to having like a schedule of observations that you know in advance. And then another interesting problem is the idea of when can we order these modes in a way that we could still use a causal numerical method. And also, even if we can't perfectly causally order them, could we get close? And if so, is there some structure there we could take advantage of to make those methods more efficient, even if we still are relying on some sort of iterative scheme? All right, so that's everything that I have to talk about. Thanks so much for your attention. And here are some references. Thank you very much, like our speaker. Um, I have one question um, about this last uh, project. You mentioned this uh, Mars Rover example, and you have this velocity profile, or this uh, um, elevation profile 